loan, especially with uh, our brother, Dr. Jay Smith. I think you are going to be amazed and amused by the stuff that he has been sharing and the research that he's been doing and the findings that he is uh, coming across. Uh, the, the type of work that Mill does has to do with a, a historical critique of Islam in general, but today we're talking specifically about the person of Muhammad, the one that we call the founder of Islam. And uh, I had Mill a few months ago with me here, along with Jay, also through a uh, Zoom, uh, as we have him right now. And he really uh, did an excellent job laying out the thesis of his findings based on the research that is being done, talking about whether or not the character of Muhammad or the person of Muhammad, as we know him, from the Islamic sources matches up with the findings he's coming across. And uh, to our surprise, of course, like everybody else, the facts that are being discovered do not jive with the traditional story. So today we wanted to continue along this discussion. Mel, thank you so much, brother, for being here with us. Hi, uh, Fadi. It's great to be back. I'm really excited to share my findings with you today. Um, if, if I may, I would like to give a shout out to one of uh, my team, Joe, who has a YouTube channel called Red Judaism, and I'm sure he would appreciate more subscribers. Um, but both he and I and another guy called Murad are, are really part of the team, and we've been working hard really the last few months, Absolutely. making new discoveries new, pretty much every day. Absolutely. And I would love really to have Murad with you uh, pretty soon here this year. And hopefully your friend, um, if he is interested in at least being with us uh, voice only, yeah. if he doesn't want to show his, his face, that will be great as well. But that's his choice. Of course, we can check yeah. with him. But I want to also remind our viewers that this is also part of my podcast, Let Us Reason. So if you are listening to this on radio, this was part of a live stream that we are doing right now on March 8th. 2021, March 8th, 2021, and this will be part one of that podcast, and we'll do part two. In other words, on radio, you'll be listening to it two weeks in a row. So, brother, tell us about the theory in general, or the hypothesis concerning Muhammad, and then the new findings that you're coming across. Okay, so I suppose there's a number of strands to, to this thesis. The first one really is that we believe that the the story of Muhammad has been fabricated, has been built up over a number of decades. And it's based loosely, I, I believe, on a key figure of Ias ibn Kapisa al Tay, who was um, a leader of the Tayyaye tribe in northern Mesopotamia um, in the early part of the 7th century. Um, but what we found is that there are other historical figures who were added to the mix, as it were. Um, and so what we believe has happened is a kind of mythology has built up, particularly in the latter part of the 8th century with um, the, the work of Ibn Isaac and then later re-edited under Ibn um, Hisham. So so that's, the, that's one element of it. The other element of it is we believe that the geography is all wrong. So the traditional account says that it all began in the Hejaz, but, and, and I was one of those that assumed that all of this must be correct. But as soon as you go digging, what you find is that none of this matches up with the historical facts. We can't find any evidence to back that up. Um, and so what it led me to um, it was when I looked at the early 7th century sources, more and more the sources were pointing further north to places like Iraq and Syria, that's not down in the Hejaz. Right. That's interesting. If I may interject, uh, just as a reminder to people, yeah. I mean, what, what Mill is mentioning is extremely, extremely important in light of the other historical criticism that Dan Gibson have done so far and, of course, Dr. J. Smith. Notice the geography. It is in the north or the northeast, uh, basically, area or region over the Arabian Peninsula, not in the Arabian Peninsula. And in this case, we're talking about the area of Mesopotamia, 
known today as parts of Persia and Iraq. And that's extremely important, folks, because we're finding other things that point to that direction, that the Petra direction for Qibla, for instance, and prayer. Uh, the uh, Here is the origin of uh, uh, possibly the real Muhammad, if you wish. And then uh, many of the main qira'at of the Quran also come from that area, Basra, Kufa, uh, as opposed to, for instance, the primary sources from Medina and Mecca. So go ahead, brother. Continue. Okay, so essentially, if you, no matter what angle you look at it, um, you find that it had to have started way up in the north. Um, for example, if we look at the sources of the stories that you find in the Quran, these are pre predominantly Syriac stories. Um, if you look at the type of script that's used in the Quran, it's it's a Nabataean script. Um, if you look at the historical context, context where there was a conflict between the Persians and the Byzantines, well, that places you way up north again. Um, and so it literally every level that we looked at, we, we found that it points up there. Um, and so I suppose today what I'd like to focus on is a key uh, um, point, which is when did it all start? Um, and so everyone assumes that the tr the tradition is correct, the Islamic tradition, that it all started in 622, the, the year of the Hijra. But what's interesting is that there are really early sources that contradict that entirely and say that it actually happened much earlier. So, um, so what actually, you're saying, the traditional date, 621, 622, is actually not the correct date. It's not the correct date, and um, I, I'm going to um, prove this quite firmly today um, using some of the earliest, earliest sources that we have, um, not only from outsiders, but actually from the people themselves, so the Tayeye themselves. And I think one of the things um, that everyone needs to note is the fact that I, I do focus a lot on the Tayeye because Thomas the Presbyter is one of our earliest sources referring to the the Tayyaye of Muhammad. And he, he wrote that down in a book in 640. So that's one of our earliest sources. But the Tayyaye has been scrubbed from the Islamic tradition. You can't find it. And that should raise red flags straight away. So as soon as I noticed the absence of the Tayyaye from the Islamic tradition, whereas I noticed it was all over the sources from the 7th century. I knew there was something up that yeah. raised my suspicion. So, And if you don't mind, uh, Mel, yeah. I want to interject something because I, I don't want the Muslims to jump all over this. Um, you know, but what, what yeah. our brother Mel is talking about is uh, uh, the Qabila to Tawai or Atta'i. Uh, this is the tribe of Ta'i, basically, or Ta'i in English. Uh, they are the one that he's referring to. Now, we know there is a character that is known to be very generous, Hatim al -Ta'i. You know, it, he was mentioned at least three times in supposedly some hadith traditions, but that was it. That was it. Yeah. You're not going to find anything in the Sira. You're not going to find anything in primary sources outside of this, uh, uh, basically, let's call it a, uh, a mythical story about Hatim al -Ta'i and his generosity or the reference in the hadith, which it could be a later redaction, by the way. We know that there is enough evidence of that by now. So yeah. I just wanted to clarify that. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, um, I, I suppose I should clarify as well. I tend to use the, the term tayaye, which is the Syriac version. So te would be the Arabic. That's that. right. So just That's to, right. Thank just you for clarifying clarify. that. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, what I'll do is I will, we'll start really in, in terms of that then. Um, so... Just to kind of tie what we're talking about today um, with the first video I did before Christmas, um, I made a few startling claims. I said that the Tayaye kingdom led by Muhammad, in inverted commas, began in 618 so th and not 622. And it was in Iraq and not in the Hijaz. So I'm going to be following up on that today with more evidence. Chinese sources tell us that the leaders of this movement were not Arabs, but Persians. So this is another uh, clangor, if you like. There were... 11 Persians who came and according to the rank as Mushu were transformed into kings. This is according to some Chinese sources. And perhaps the most startling was that Muhammad lived not in the Hijaz, but in Iraq. And his real name was Ias ibn Kapisa. 
Ahmed is just a messianic title given to him. Now, if you think about, you know, the Islamic tradition and how it gives you the name of Muhammad and his father and mother and all the rest of it, and this elaborate uh, family tree, um, when you realize that actually this is just a title, it makes you realize that this is a major fabrication. So all of this um, story, this biography, had to be fabricated um, consciously, knowing that there's no basis to this. And this would have happened over a period uh, f about 100 years or more, maybe over 120 years or so. It went from um, knowledge of a guy who was called Iyas to this uh, mythical figure of Muhammad, obviously replaced down in the Hejaz, away from where it all happened. So that's really where we're coming from, from the earlier video. Now, just a little bit about the term Dashi, which is a term we find in the Islamic sources. Um, so the Tayyayi is what we call it in Syriac, and Tay is what the, um, it's the, the Arabs refer to it. Um, but in China, it was called um, originally in the 7th century, uh, Dezik. That's how it was pronounced in the 7th century. But nowadays, it's pronounced Dashi. Um, mm. And I will be using that term whenever I, I refer to the, the Chinese sources. Um, now, at the same time, in Tibet, they, they call them uh, Taishi, which is pretty much the same as, uh, as uh, Taishi. And uh, Tazik is what the Zok Turks refer to them. So the term changed over time, but we have records of the names in, in the records over a, a long period of time. So that's the same group. And um, our audience will be aware that to the west of China nowadays, you have a country called Tajikistan, right. which actually is based on this same tribe. Yeah, Tajikistan. Um, what's interesting over... T yeah, in Arabic is Tajikistan, which is kind of interesting, really. Um, uh, you know, so so here we go again, that there is a possibility of an origin also that comes way north. Yeah. Um, so uh, gradually over the centuries, the, 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 the notion of what was a, a Tay changed. Originally, it was a very um, Arabic or Arabian thing. And gradually it became more and more Persian. So it wasn't it wasn't a strict tribe in the sense of ethnicity, I believe. It it seems to be very um fluid and flexible. So it might be that this this association wasn't based just on ethnicity, it may have been based on religious beliefs as well. Um so that's that. Um there are two independent Chinese sources that confirm that the kingdom of Dashi, the Taiyaye was founded in the year 618 AD and not in 622. So the first one is a really early one, um, 651, in fact, July of 651, in the second year of the Yang Hui era, the Dashi dispatched its first envoy to the Tang court, which is in China. And this is recorded in two separate entries in Chinese records, which obviously further strengthens the case. One was in the old book of Tang, and the second uh, place was Seifu Yuan Gi. So that's really important. When the Taiyayi say that their kingdom began in 618, which as you'll see, this is, an ex this is an excellent primary source of information that I believe we can trust to nail down the starting point of their kingdom. So. There's a lot of conflicting sources and so on from, you know, from the Islamic tradition and so on. But this is a really strong source. It's coming from the Taiyaye themselves when they visit the Chinese and they're telling them when their kingdom started. And mm -hmm. what's interesting is that the, um, there's a bit of a coincidence in that the, the Tang dynasty also started in the same year. So perhaps they had a bit to talk about there, that the fact that both the, of their kingdoms started in the same year now so it says in in the chinese source it says in the second year of yang uh, Hui era 651 ad 
the Dashi began to send envoys to pay tributes. The king's surname is Dashi, and his first name is Kanmi Mu, uh, Muo Muo Ni, which I, I've made a note down below. I believe that is a reference to Amir al Muminin. So that would be the Chinese rendering of that. So it's not really his first name. It's actually the the um, the commander of the faithful. Right. In in and yeah. And so and when it says the king's surname, it's basically it's the I think you call it the patronymic, which is the, the name of the tribe. Okay. So the invoice said it had been thirty four years since the establishment of the kingdom, during which time the crown had been passed down to three kings. So that's an interesting detail. So by 651, we can say um, there had been four kings of this Taiyaye kingdom by 651. Yeah. So that's an, an, an additional detail that we can nail down. Absolutely. Give me one second here. Uh, I want to talk to the control room if they can show me the timer because uh, we're doing this as part of our podcast as well. Uh, let us reason. And uh, the other thing... Uh, that I would like to, uh, the other thing that I would like to also uh, reference here to, uh, there is a comment that is being made by someone, um, I think H. Eder keeps asking about uh, Muwatta Malik. And uh, Malik is the founder, by the way, of the Maliki school of uh, Sharia. And in his mind, Muwatta Malik basically considered to be one of the earliest collections of hadith. And Malik, of course, is, was one of the uh, companions, or at least the um, uh, the people who lived around the time of the Prophet. My response to this, uh, H. Adair, is show us one single manuscript that belongs to him that could be dated back to the 7th century. So it's no difference whatsoever. It's just another redaction that went all the way back to somebody that is claimed to be around the time of the Prophet. So I don't see any issue here whatsoever. Uh, we have about seven minutes left for this podcast, brother. So uh, go ahead. Wherever we uh, uh, basically end, we'll pick it up from in the next uh, part. Okay. Right. So this is one source that, that clearly says from the Tayyai themselves that it all started in 618 and not in uh, 622. And the original text in Chinese for the 651 envoy is there. Okay, so for, for those who are Chinese, um, now the bit down below, it says in the second year of Yongwei, I think that's actually the same as what I've just read, so I won't, won't repeat myself. Now the second piece of evidence is quite intriguing. It's, it's from a, a letter from Samarkand in 719 to the Chinese, so to the Tang Dynasty. So this is literally um, on the 100th centenary of the starting of the Taiyaye. Okay, so the ruler of the Kang, which is in Samarkand, Samarkand, wrote to the Tang Emperor and said it was the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Taiyaye Kingdom. So you can see there, so we now have another source, which is like halfway between Iraq and China, right. saying exactly the same thing. So it was 618 so is, or 619, give or take. Yeah, so it's, it's basically... Essentially, the same. We're talking in the same ballpark here, a hundred years later, and obviously, there's no possibility of any kind of collusion going on. These are independent of each other. So uh, let me let me just ask this important question. The reason why we're focusing on six eighteen six nineteen has something to do with the hijra, correct? Yes. Yeah. So if if um, if the Islamic tradition can't get such an important year correct what else have they got wrong it's like really crucial you know it, it like things like when was muhammad born when did, he, when did he die when did the hijra actually happen so if they've got that year wrong first of all why did they get it wrong and why is why is it wrong sorry why is it wrong and what is the correct year so it's actually really crucial because everything else hinges on that that's like a foundation stone and if you, like, for example, it's relevant when it comes to rock inscriptions. So, for example, if you find a rock inscription in the 7th century, which says in the year of the Arabs, and you assume that it, it's, it means from the year since 622, but it's actually 618 in, in reality, it means that your, your historical foundations are wrong. So it's really crucial. Um, so it has a, a very far-reaching impact in terms of 
understanding the the sequence of events. So in this letter, he he's, he let me just read it here. The letter was from the ruler of the Kang requesting military assistance from the Tang Emperor in the year 719. The letter says this year, 719, is the exact 100 years since the founding of Dashi. Therefore, we can include that the Taiyai, or Dashi, as it is called in Chinese, was founded in 618. So the way I would understand it is that, you know, if you if you count up from 618, it's it's one year, um, say, would be 619 and two years. And if you were to work it up, that would bring you to 719, so 100 years later. That's right. Um, now, what's, what's interesting is, as an aside, is that if you notice that he's seeking military assistance as the Taiyai are attacking his kingdom. So, you know, this is a kind of important detail. Um, why are the Taiyai going halfway to China to attack the people in Samarkand? You know, um, we often hear the story oh, the, that um, Islam has never attacked people on the offensive, it's always been on the defensive. But here we see evidence that they actually went out of the way to attack a country that was thousands of miles away. And this was part of the, the methods used to expand the empire. Right. And uh, it's interesting, we get repeated requests in the sources for the Chinese to intervene and help them. And it's quite sad, really, in, so, in some respects, to see the 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 multiple requests for assistance and reports of the suffering of the people who are not in conflict with the Taiyai. It's simply that the Taiyai wants to take over as much land as possible and enslave the people. That's excellent. Uh, Mel, we have about two minutes to wrap up this uh, podcast. Uh, so in, in maybe 30 seconds, what should people expect in the second half? Uh, what are you going to cover? I suppose the, the, the big one is... The Hadith tell us that in the time of Muhammad, Muhammad banned alcohol. And, and so in the second half, we're going to question that and actually um, give evidence that actually that's not correct. So Very good. And we're going to talk about, uh, we, we're going to revisit maybe the Persian Empire as well and the invasion, uh, you know, just to pick it up from here since you ended up with that. So thank you, brother. And thank you, everyone who is watching us right now uh, live. Uh, we will be going to part two shortly here in about a minute uh, and a half from now. Uh, I will pause for just maybe uh, a minute or so in between. We, you're still going to see us live in studio. If you're listening to this on our podcast, Let Us Reason, that means it's next week when you get to listen to this second part of the podcast. However, if you have access to YouTube or access to our channel, Sira International on YouTube, or access to our Facebook page, alfadi.sira, you will be able to go and watch this immediately because it is streaming live right now on both the YouTube channel and Facebook. And I'll end up also sharing it later into my other Facebook pages and groups that I'm involved in. So many people will get to benefit from all of this. Mohammed Rashid, thank you so much for joining us. We welcome you, of course, and we hope that this show will be beneficial to you to help you examine uh, the foundation of the faith that you're following, that I was following myself, and it crumbled, and I found Christ, and I pray that you will find Jesus as your Lord and Savior. For the rest of you, thank you so much for joining us here. This is Al Fadi, and we're wrapping up our part one of the podcast, Let Us Reason. Until we meet again next time, have a blessed day. All right, brother, we are going to start now part two of our show. So uh, let's uh, let's do it. Let's go live. OK, well, this is Al Fadi again. I want to th thank you for part two uh, or joining us for part two of Let Us Reason. Uh, last week, you probably if you're listening to it on radio, you've heard our brother Mill uh, making uh, amazing, amazing, basically, uh, or sharing with us amazing discoveries concerning the possibility that the, um, the, the, the start of the history of Muhammad migrating or beginning to uh, emerge as a leader uh, is not really 622, as the Islamic traditions will want us to believe, but it's actually earlier than that, possibly 618, and uh, there are enough evidence in the writings of some Chinese sources 
and other sources that collaborate the fact that an umpire known as the Tayai or the Ta'iyin, uh, basically in Arabic, uh, have been founded by a certain Muhammad, and it began to also do expansions of its territory, similar to what we read in the traditional, uh, basically, sources of Islam, except some of the dates are off, and also some of the facts are also off. With that in mind, brother, thank you so much for joining us again. And thank you for all the information that you've shared. And I welcome, of course, you continuing, uh, you know, to share from the last time you left off, which is the invasion of Samarkand. Yes. Yeah, so so the last time I spoke to you, we saw two Chinese sources. One was a source that was based on what the Taiyai told the Tang court on a visit to China. And the second one was a reference to the centenary of the founding of the Taiyai from a, a letter from uh, Samarkand to China. So, so the king of Samarkand. So we're going to add to that. Um, so this is just the, the the Chinese. For those who can read Chinese, this is the, the, the wording of that text. Um, now, what's interesting that those Chinese sources tally very nicely with other sources that's there. It wasn't just in China and Samarkand that had the impression that the Taiyai kingdom had begun in 618. So as far west as Spain also reported that in the Hispanic Chronicle in 754. So it says, the Saracens rebelled in 618, the seventh year of the Emperor Heraclius, and appropriated for themselves Syria, Arabia, and Mesopotamia. So that works exactly with the Chinese sources. There is also another source, the Byzantine Arab Chronicle of 741, relying on the Syriac common source, which we don't have, um, which also says similarly, in the seventh year of the aforesaid ruler, Heraclius, the Saracens in rebellion and hostile to the inhabitants of the provinces of the Romans by stealth rather than by open attacks incite the neighboring tribes. And it goes on to say it occurred in 618. Now, so the Chinese sources repeatedly tell us the founders of the Taiyai kingdom were Persians, not Arabs. This is another part of the jigsaw. So this is from a Chinese encyclopedia that was completed in 801 AD, the Tong Chen. It says, some also say that in the beginning there was a Persian who supposedly had the help of a god in obtaining edge weapons with which he killed people, subsequently calling for all the persons to become his followers. So that's interesting. So that's in competition with the Islamic narrative that says that the, the founder of all of this was an Arab. Well, I mean, uh, if I may interject no. something here, Mel, um, yeah. it really makes yep. sense, makes sense, uh, at least from me, uh, from a forensic standpoint, that now that we're pinpointing the area of Persia, and the uh, establishment of a new empire. And yes, maybe it went all the way to Spain or all the way north. I mean, we're not debating uh, territorially what happened because we have evidence that something really basically went through these territories. We're debating the dates and the character who started this whole thing and redaction to take it back to a different person, a different area. But all that to say, it makes perfect sense why we have the hadith collectors like Bukhari and Muslim and others, all of them came from Persia. I mean, that should be a yeah. shocker for our Sunni Muslims because that, that tells us right there that there was something vibrant going on in there that prompted all of this to take place. Yeah. Um, and you kind of have to question why they recast the, the leader as an Arab rather than a Persian because it's the Persians who are saying that this guy was an Arab obviously 150 years later, or even possibly 200 years later. And my suspicion is that maybe it suited them to say that he was an Arab because they're dependent on millions of Arabs to do all the fighting for them. You know, they're the ones leading everything. The Persians are leading it, but they need the Arabs to um, believe in the cause. They need them to do their, their bidding while they get rich on it, you know. So I think they're, they're, you know, they, they recast the founder to suit their interests. So there was, there was a, f a financial incentive. 
Now, the other aspect to, to bear in mind is that there are many houses in, in Persia. And so, so what really happened was an internal conflict within the Persians themselves. The Sasanians had been kicked out, but others had taken over the rule. So that's essentially what happened rather than it right. being... Arabs versus Persians. Yeah, good point. Know? And also, I wonder, so, Mel, uh, at some point, maybe we can talk about, if you have done a research on that, the, the reason why we have a split, theologically speaking, between the Sunni and the Shia as well. You know, so, so you wonder if this has anything to do with that competition that was taking place at that time. Yeah, that's, that's an area that um, I haven't looked into enough yet. Um, that would probably be there, something I will look at in the future research, the difficulty is is really nailing down when the Sunni Shia divide happened, because again, um, there's an awful lot of redaction going on. So it's incredibly difficult to actually get a handle on when things happened and why. Um, so the you know that's one of the problems with that area. But I th- what I would say um, just on that is that all of the the different Islamic sects drew. Um, ideas and practices from the same pool, from the same well, as it were. Um, it wasn't that different sects were invented over time. It was more a case of they took from the the, the larger pool whatever it was that they 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 wanted, and formed their own communities. Um, and so, really, I think if you were to examine all the different sects and look at their beliefs, you'll find a common set of of ideas there that would probably give you a fair idea of what the beliefs were in the early days and if you couple that with the numismatic evidence i think that would be a good way to go in terms of um really having a peek into what was going on in the seventh century before islam got fully formed wonderful but, um, wonderful a- uh, again i want to thank you brother i want to thank everyone for joining us you're listening to Uh, A live stream of Let Us Reason right now with Brother Mel, but also our podcast, Let Us Reason. And the talk here is about who is the real Muhammad. And our Brother Mel laid it out in in an amazing way, even though he has a short time to do so, that there is enough evidence to point us to, once again, uh, northeast of Arabia to a different person uh, who is a certain Muhammad, supposedly from a different tribe known as the Thai tribe. Now, last time, Mel... You made a connection to the pronunciation of Quraysh. Could you revisit that one more time? Yes, um, it, 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 I suppose this is open to um, open to discussion. But the the the, the word seems to be um, related to the Persian pronunciation of Cyrus, so Quraysh. Um, and so it right, could be right. that the Quraysh were actually descendants of um, Cyrus or people who supported the Cyrus side of things. That's right. Um, and so that's one that's one possibility. Now, obviously, that's not 100% yet, but that's one possible hypothesis in terms of the origin of Quraysh. Um, but there doesn't seem to be any evidence of a group called the Quraysh way down in the Hejaz. That's right. And, and, and let me... Let me... So far. Let me support what you're saying because the, the word for Cyrus in Arabic is Quraysh. Korash. So I want people to Korash, Korash. Notice, you know, sometimes it gets lost, lost in the pronunciation. And with that in mind, brother, I want to just make a quick comment. Muhammad Rashid, you're starting to get delusional. Sunni Islam is the only true Islam. We're not talking about Sunni Islam or Shia Islam. In fact, we're decimating the argument about even Islam altogether. So you promise you're here to learn, but I'm not seeing that as for now. So I'm going to let our Top Gun moderators take care of this if this continues right now. So please calm down and just watch what we're doing and learn from it that there is no such thing as Sunni or Shia. There is no such thing as a divinely inspired religion called Islam. Thank you. Go ahead, brother. Okay, so the, so uh, so we have here in, in, in our sources, Dashi situates in the west of Persia. This is a Chinese source. There was a Persian man herding camels in the mountain uh, Jufen Modina. One day a line man appeared out of nowhere telling him, there is also a black stone with text carved on it. You will become the king if you read and do what the carved text on the black stone tells you. The bit I would like to focus on there is the fact it's it's happening in the west of Persia, not to the west. 
So the land of Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia was part of the Persian Empire at that time. And so the pers person who the Chinese source identifies again is a Persian man. And it, it, it clearly says you will become the king. And the person who was the king in the early part of the 7th century was Ias Ibn Kapisa, al -Tay. So that fits in nicely. The Persian then followed the lion man's words and did find a large amount of weapons and the black stone with carved text telling them how to raise an army and rebel against the Persian or Sassanid dynasty. He then claimed himself to be the king and set up a separatist regime in the western part of the Sassanid Empire. So this is a great source. It, it comes from the uh, Zhiyo Tang Shu, which was compiled in 945 AD, but it was using the 651 AD report from the Taiyai invoice. So while on one hand it appears to be quite late because it was using an early source, I believe that is quite reliable. Now, obviously, there's parts of that which seems to be um, sort of condensed and 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 there's all, you can see the, the beginnings of a mythology in the way that account is told. So I, I believe that this story um, is what happened with Ias just before he became um, the king of the Taiyaye, which would have been in 602. So in the space of 50 years, you can see how it's gone from a story of um, uh, Husro asking um, a guy called Ias to retrieve some weapons in a in a weapons dump to a, a sort of the beginnings of a mythology. So if you imagine, if that's what happens in 50 years, can you imagine what could happen in 100 years or 150 years? So we're seeing how mythologies gradually develop here, even in a source like this. Right. Um, so, so we have about 11 now we minutes. Also have this yeah, we have about 11 minutes left to wrap up this part of the podcast. And uh, you're going to talk about alcohol also prohibition. But uh, I want to remind everyone, please, if you have any questions, uh, put uh, Al Sira, I mean, uh, I should say, at Sira International in front of it. And if we didn't ad address it before the close of the uh, Let Us Reason podcast, we will continue live for at least another five to 10 minutes if mail schedule permits. And we'll see if there is any questions relevant to this topic. Uh, you know, I see one saying, let's debate. I'm not, we're not, are we debating right now? Is this like a debate? We're talking about facts. You want to refute these facts? Go and present them. Have your own channel. Have your own people. And then we'll see what we can do about that. Okay, brother, go ahead. Okay, so again from the Zhiyu Tang Shu, compiled to 945. It says, after this initial Persian leader started it off, it says there were 11 Persians who came and according to their rank as Mushu, were transformed into kings. We don't see any Arabs, you know, who are leaders. After this, the masses gradually gave their allegiance, and subsequently, Persia was extinguished, and Byzantium, Fulin, which is the Chinese term for it, was crushed. When the original king had died, which we believe is Ias, his office passed to the first Mushu, and now the king was the third Mushu. The royal surname is Tashi. Now... The thing that the Muslims watching have to get have to get their head around is this is not the Chinese saying this. This is not any outsider saying this. This is the people themselves who started this. So the Taiyaye are sending invoice and telling the Chinese how it all started. So what you notice is they're not saying Muhammad started this. They're saying it was a Persian who started this. And it's clearly in the vicinity of Persia, so Mesopotamia, or Iraq, if you like, is the location where it happened. It wasn't down in, in the Hejaz. So I think that's that's really crucial. Now, uh, there's something else I wanted to mention as well. Um, we also get clues from the caliphs' names that were Persian. So, for example, if we take this word here, Yazata. This is a Zoro, Zoroastrian word. It's from it's a um, the, the Zoroastrian text is called Avesta. So this word was a, a Zoroastrian concept with a wide range of meanings, but generally signifying or used as an epithet of a divinity. So it meant worthy of worship or veneration. So essentially, if you can follow me, this word is a Persian word, and look. 
down below. From this word we get Yazid. And so we have Caliph Yazid the first, Caliph Yazid the second, Caliph Yazid the third. And look at the years. So this is more evidence, I would suggest, that there is a strong Persian um, present presence in the leadership, even so early as that. So this really undermines the, the Islamic narrative that there was an Arab who, f- who founded this kingdom, followed by a number of other Arabs. It's, it's, it's really a Persian thing. So why are caliphs not using names that... Oh, sorry, I've, I think I've read it wrong. Why are caliphs not only using names that are Padlavi, Middle Persian, but specifically linked to Zoroastrianism? So, so it's, there's a double whammy in this. It's not, not just the fact that it indicates they're Persian, but they're using terms or names which are based on Zoroastrian ideas. Right. That, that should sort of raise some red flags there. What is actually going on? Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Um, so as, now we're going to move on to a, 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 um, another topic, which is the alcohol one. I hope we have enough time here. We have about so the uh, Chinese source. We have about six minutes for you, if that's enough, brother. That should be that there should be plenty. So the Chinese sources um, also call into question when exactly alcohol became prohibited. Was it really during Muhammad's time, as the Hadith suggests? So what do we have? We have we have various different verses in the. Quran, which which show a kind of a development on the issue of alcohol. And then we have, um, there are various hadiths that refer to Umar, the contemporary of Muhammad, who um, was a heavy drinker. um, And and there are hadiths which talk about Muhammad um, prohibiting alcohol. He he first of all um, said, well, you know, it's not the best thing to be drinking, but okay. But then later, it was more a case of you shouldn't drink alcohol. And this is supposed to have happened in the early part of the 7th century. Now, if there are Muslims watching, um, tell me if I'm wrong. Is uh, is that a fair um, depiction of the Hadiths? Is, do you believe that Muhammad banned alcohol in the early part of the 7th century? It would be interesting before we yeah, move well- on whether they think that is the case. Well, I can tell you the Quran has uh, three different occasions for banning the Hadith gradually, and that's really a solid case for the proof of abrogation, which many Muslims these days deny, because it allowed it uh, in certain places, then it prohibited inside the mosque, then prohibited completely, uh, basically. And in the words of Zakir Nayak, uh, may God bless his heart, he'll tell you this is an example of the wisdom of Allah. But anyway... Uh, so uh, they, they definitely uh, cannot really get outside of what the Quran says and the Hadith collaborates. Okay. So what I'm going to suggest, actually, and there's really strong evidence for this, that that alcohol wasn't banned yet in the 7th century. It was allowed. And the caliphs um, drank alcohol. They drank wine. And uh, it was really in the early part of the 8th century that um, Umar II was the person who decided to ban alcohol at, during a time when um, the the Arabs and the Persians were increasingly become more uh, um, what's the word more religious, and uh, they wanted to kind of stand on that moral high ground by banning alcohol. They were also in a stage of iconoclasm, so they were banning images at that time as well. So. It appears to be that this really started in the the early part of the 8th century, which would make it roughly 100 years after it was supposed to have happened. So here is the evidence. So in July 716, we have um, an envoy that goes to um, China. And this is recorded in the Seifu Yuan Gi. Okay? And this is the record that they put into into their record, uh, the record they put into their book on that visit from the Taiyaye. It says, received invoice presenting golden silk woven robe, jewelry decorated with jade, and a luxurious wine cup. Seifu Yuan Gi tribute from the king of Dashi named He Mimo Ni, which I believe is, um, it means Amir Muminin. Right. So there you have it. Why? Why would the Taiyaye 
if they're Muslims and they know that the Quran has banned it, supposedly, and the Hadiths are saying that Muhammad had banned it, why are they giving a wine cup? Um, which obviously suggests that they think there's nothing wrong with drinking wine if they're giving that as a gift. Um, does that really calls into question um, what really went on in the early days? And what's interesting is it was during the reign of Caliph... Uh, this was during the reign of Caliph Suleiman, 715-717, whereas Umar II was the one who banned it. Right. Okay, so Umar II was straight after that time frame. Um, so you're talking post-717. Um, interestingly, Hadid reports that Umar I used to be a heavy drinker but gave it up. Is this a redaction? I would suggest that actually what's really happened, this is solid evidence of the process of redaction that was happening in the 8th century. Events that were contemporary were being projected back to the time of Muhammad in order to, to make the, the narrative clean so there's no messiness. They wanted to get rid of all the messiness. They didn't want um, people to, to know that the caliphs were actually quite happy to drink alcohol right up to that time. And so they're changing the, the history. So, you know, I sometimes get accused of revisionism, but the way I look at it, that is revisionism. You know, if you if you know that there, you know, their wine cups were being given in 716, and then later you write hadiths that says, no, 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 um, alcohol was banned way back in the early part of the 7th century. That's a clear example of revisionism. That's right. That's right. So... Well, that's you know. great, brother. Uh, we're going to wrap up uh, this podcast, but please stay with us because we want to uh, have you on the air for at least uh, five to ten minutes, if you can, to see if there is any questions to yeah, interact absolutely. with. And also, we want to make some announcements. But thank you, everyone, of course, for joining us here. This is part two of the podcast, Let Us Reason. However, this is also live right now on our YouTube channel, Sierra International, and also on our Facebook page, alfadi.sira. Brother, what is your YouTube channel real quickly? Uh, my YouTube channel is Sneakers Corner. Really Sneakers easy. Corner. Sneakers yeah. Corner. Oops. And, um, yeah. uh, you know, you can always go and learn even more in-depth about these topics, which we plan on having uh, our brother here uh, do an entire series with us. Uh, we don't know yet if he can manage to fly over or at least we'll have him over Zoom. Either way, we want to do an entire series, but you can watch also his interactions with Dr. Jay Smith. With that in mind, I want to thank all of you who've been following us also on uh, the uh, podcast. And hopefully you found this particular episode or series to be interesting. Thank you so much as always. And for those of you who are watching us, play, uh, please stay tuned. We will continue right now. Thank you. This is Al Fadi. Over and out. God bless. All right, we are going now. We're we're off the uh, the the podcast. Uh, so let's see if there's any questions for us here. Um, uh, one thing, folks, I want to mention to you that uh, we have with us here in studio David Wood. So um, in about probably four uh, three hours from now, at uh, six p.m. New York time which is uh, basically 11 p.m. UK time and also is, um, uh, let me think about it for a second, 10 a.m. Australian time tomorrow. I love Australia because it's always tomorrow ahead of the time. So I always contact my Australian friends and ask them how was tomorrow, uh, where they're at, uh, so I can anticipate what's going to happen in my area tomorrow. That's just a joke. But all that to say, we're going to have David Wood with us today and also tomorrow and we'll be doing some interesting things of course in a classic david wood he came up with a topic today i'm like wow that's fascinating let's do it so uh, basically stay in suspense until we do this so we'll see all of you hopefully uh in about three hours from now live but we are doing also recordings with david as well with that in mind let's look and see if we have any particular uh questions for mel or for myself I see um, that Muhammad Rashid is, is just echoing the traditional Islamic way of thinking. And I am, I mean, I understand, Muhammad, why you're struggling with what we're saying. And you're saying that the Shia are basically hypocrites. The Shia are liars. Well, I mean, that's, that's basically what the Sunnis say. So you're just echoing what we know. 
We're talking about the origin of the whole thing. And there are so many holes in the narrative in the words of Yasser Qadi, may peace be upon him. So all that to say is that uh, please just listen to what we're saying. Watch it. Watch the other shows that Mill has done on his channel, Sneakers Corner. Watch his uh, also interviews with Jay Smith on Fonder Films. And I think you are going to get the whole picture. And uh, I don't see any other questions. So, Mill, what are you working on for now? I mean, uh, just to give people ideas. Well, um, it's, it's probably d dozens of different uh, things at the minute. Um, one of the areas that I'm looking at at the moment um, is the Eucharist, which is a, you know, it's a Christian thing. But there's elements of the Eucharist in the sect of um, Alawite. So the Alawite sect, and that's going to be um, an area they're going to look in, into. And that would suggest um, that there is a different story in terms of the origins of Islam. I, I think there's elements of that that go way back to the 7th century when the, it was a time when Christianity and Zoroastrianism played a huge part in the development of this new religion called Islam. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the areas. Uh, this quick comments, uh, uh, dear brother uh, Alistair Whitehead uh, is is asking an excellent question. He's saying, how does this tie into the Dan Gibson work in terms of Petra and Jordan? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, um, I don't have it to hand, but there there was a Jewish source that I found, which said that the the king of the Persians and the king of the Arabs were in conflict, and the, the king of the Arabs headed west to the uh, Edomites, which would be Petra. Um, and uh, so there is a tie-in. So there is something, what I'm referring to is really what happened in the East. And I think where the story continues is what happened next after the 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 Tayyayi rebelled against the Persians. So they headed West to um, form a better base, as it were, safer to the West in places like Petra. And I'm also, um, so I mean, uh, uh, one way to look at it, and, and I think that will be a, uh, a safe theory, is that even if they headed west, they probably would have been fascinated by the worship, the form of worship that was taking place already by, uh, uh, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the, the Nabataeans uh, in there, and they probably adapted to it. I mean, so, so you don't see anything. Yeah. I mean, in fact, we have some redactions uh, to that effect uh, in the traditional story of Islam about taking something from north, and creating Hubal, basically south in uh, Kaaba, uh, and then later on, of course, uh, Islamicizing the whole thing. Yeah. There's another element that's kind of key as well. Uh, Joe from uh, or my, let's call it the sister channel, Red Judaism, um, has been developing a theory really over the last 20 years, um, which has crystallized with a, a sect called the, um, I better get it right, Idumean Karaites. And they're focused around the area Petra. And so to give you a, a very quick summary, if we analyze the Quranic text, it, it suggests that there was a sect uh, in the early part of the 7th century who were messianic. They had elements of Christianity and elements of Judaism. And they, they were setting about um, winning people over to their sect. And so when we... When we were analyzing different uh, parts of the Quran, what we noticed is that there's a head preacher and apprentice preachers, and there's a dialogue going on between them. And so it could be that what you're seeing in the Quran is really correspondence between this group, and it isn't the way the standard Islamic narrative presents the Quran. So when the Quran is talking about a Quran, okay, so it's almost like as if there's another book. The, the Syriac word that's been used is electionary. So what? So where we're looking into that is the idea that there was um, an attempt to translate for the first time the the electionary, which is you know used both by Christians and Jews as a as a an easy way of uh, finding passages in the Bible for worship. What they were doing is they were translating those into Arabic for the first time. And so if you if you revisit all of the passages where it refers to the Arabic Quran and you 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 look at it afresh with the eyes of what I've just explained, you'll see that there's a different story going on underneath the surface. Um, and so 
what has happened then is that there was a massive redaction of, of those correspondence in our view and uh, things were were removed to cover up to to some extent what was really going on so um one of the big conundrums that i often had whenever i've tried to read the quran is the fact that who's talking to who so one moment it's supposedly the words of allah to muhammad next moment allah is in third person sometimes allah is talking in first person singular Sometimes it's plural, um, and so it's really confusing. Whereas if you understand it as really the words of human beings talking to other human beings, then it makes perfect sense. But um, so that's something that we're developing. So, so we think that uh, an awful lot of it can be explained in that whole area around Petra as well. But we we have a different take on it than Dan Gibson would. We 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 would tend to be much more skeptical of the Islamic tradition than say Dan would. Um, but you know we're not throwing we're not throwing out his his work necessarily. We think he's on the right track, but um, we we would go further in terms of our skepticism. You know. Yes, I, I, I will I'll, I will pass it on to you. It's actually found in Robert Hoyland's book, um, Seeing Islam as Others Saw It. So it's, I found it in there. It's a very short paragraph. Yeah. 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 I, I'll pass it on. I'll, I'll pass it on anyway. Yeah. I can hear you on my side, but so. you should hear me now, right? I mean, I think uh, hopefully. I mean, just tell me th what did you miss, guys? Just the last maybe minute or so. It's no big deal. I mean, th there wasn't anything interesting, so we're still saying mute. Okay, so I'm going to repeat one more time, Alistair. Um, uh, the, the, the article that uh, Mill was referring to is in a book by Robert Hoyland. And Robert Hoyland did a book called Seeing Islam as Others Saw It. So I, I told you that not to worry about the book. I got you covered. So uh, we will be communicating about this as well. All right. Well, brother, any last um any last minute, uh, you know, thoughts about things that you wanted to offload uh, in terms of this topic? Yeah, um, I, I, there was one point that I, I didn't get to mention. It's interesting that the earliest name for Islam in China was the religion of the Taiyaye. So that Dashi, uh, what was it? Uh, it was uh, Dashi Jiao was the earliest term for, for Islam. 
So that, again, reinforces the idea we're talking about a group that were located across Syria and Iraq. And it's the religion of that group and not some group way down the Hejaz that the Chinese identified as as being Islam, if you like. So I think that's really important. So there's an awful lot of early evidence that says really that the Islamic tradition is radically, radically wrong. And it's interesting also that the fact that even the Chinese in the middle of the 8th century noticed that the story had changed. So when the Abbasids took over, immediately the Chinese wrote down in the records, we've got now a new story from the Taiyei, the story has changed, so we'll write down both stories. We don't know why there's a new story, but they're now um, they're taking note of that. And, and all of a sudden we see that instead of the Taiyei being mentioned, now it's the Koresh. So this yes. new subgroup is being is being brought in. So we see, you know, the the telltale signs of a change in narrative in in these records, and that's why um, these sources are really useful to nail things down. Absolutely, and of course, uh, uh, in case people didn't hear me say this, I want to bring you back, and we're going to do a video series on this topic, uh, meaning like we all are going to do a number of these videos back to back uh, to allow people to end up enjoying watching the whole thing. We, there may be repetitions of the things that we've covered and also we'll add any new things. And in case folks, you did not hear what I was saying, I have David Woods right here in studio. David Woods right here in studio. And in about less than three hours from now, we're going to go live, he and I. And uh, we uh, that will be 6 p.m. New York Times equivalent to basically 11 p.m. UK times and 10 a.m. Australian time. And we are going to talk about a number of exciting topics. So we're going to do a live stream today, me and David, and tomorrow also we'll do another live stream, live stream myself and David. But then in between myself and David would are recording a number of new videos and series that we will mention to you during the live stream as well. With that uh, said, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you to, we had, you attracted our top gun, basically, moderators. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're the top guns that you attracted today. They all are here. They're sharp. And I know why they're sharp. Because people complain about the fact that they muted them, they blocked them. And I say, yes, that's their job. They clean house for me all the time. And I love that because I'm not here in terms of allowing people to come and disrespect our viewers, disrespect our guests, and also distract. I mean, uh, Mill, I don't know how it is on your uh, channel, but here we have professional distractors. They just come here just for that yeah. purpose and that purpose alone. Yeah, it's it's a common problem. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you again, Mel. And really, uh, please uh, pass on my uh, interest in having, uh, you said Joe, right? You know, a friend of yours, Joe. Yeah, yeah he'd Joe be, he'd and be very Murad keen also, if on. I can have them both. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we'll get, get them on. Just give us a day and we'll, we will get them on. Yeah, that'll no be problem. great if we can have a, yeah, a uh, basically a uh, panel discussion, if you wish, and, and we'll do that. All yeah, right. That'd be great. Very good, brother. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for making time for us. We appreciate Thank you, you very much. and we will be in touch uh, pretty soon here. All Thank right. You. Thanks a lot. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. And uh, in, uh, in less than three hours from now, we'll see you live again. And uh, here in studio with me will be our brother, David Wood. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. This is Al Fadi over now.